Good morning, church. Welcome to our online services this morning. I hope that you will be blessed by our service and that our worship is a time of, of fulfillment, or I'm sorry, filling for you and your family, and also that you give it your all even if you're, you know, by yourself. So if you will, will you just pray with me as we begin our services today? Dear God, thank you for allowing us, Lord, to be able to worship you today. We pray that you would bless us as we worship you, and we pray that our worship would please you and that it would be acceptable to you. Thank you that you allow us, Lord, to praise you, and thank you that you're going to speak through uh, Richard and also Mr. Royster for communion and, and the sermon. So, Lord, open our hearts and our ears to receive and may you be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. With my heart I sing great are you, of the Lord's Supper. I'd like to share with you uh, from Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 24 through the end of the chapter. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This week, in one of the many conference calls I've been a part of, the team got to squabbling a bit over really what were some smaller details of the situation. And at one point, I encouraged them to take a step back and think about the big picture. They really needed to look at what we were trying to accomplish. I, I can't begin to comprehend the love that it took for God to send his only son the love that it took for Jesus to offer himself as that perfect sacrifice for our sins. But Jesus knew the total picture. He knew 
why he was on earth. This had been planned since creation. And so he understood his purpose. And that purpose was to be that sacrifice that would forgive us of all sins. A sacrifice he would only offer once with his own blood from his perfect life. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, we need to remember him. In fact, that was Jesus' instructions when he created the Lord's Supper, was to do this in remembrance of me. But we also need to think and reflect upon what this means to us, what the true gift is, the love that it took. Because through that sacrifice that Jesus offered, we are forgiven. We have great joy. We are his brothers and sisters, we are God's children, and we know that we have a heavenly home prepared for us. So as we now partake of the bread, let's go to our heavenly Father in prayer. Our most holy and heavenly Father, what a tremendous sacrifice. Father, the love that it took, as I said, we, we don't truly understand, but we are so grateful. We are so joyful that that sacrifice was offered. It was perfect. It was offered once. And so, Father, as we partake of this bread, let our minds go back to Christ's body that was offered on the cross as part of that sacrifice for our sins. And think about not only what he endured, but what it means to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. And now allow us to go back to our Father in prayer as we partake of the cup. Shall we pray? Our holy and heavenly Father, we continue in this memorial as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. The blood that he shed, the blood that washes over us, it washed away all of our sins and made us white as snow. And Father, we know that this cup represents that blood. And so, Father, we partake of it, uh, knowing what the sacrifice meant and what it means to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just as we have spoken of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we now have an opportunity to sacrifice back in just some small way. And so by whatever means you contribute to God's kingdom and to the work here at Buckingham Road, whether that be online through the website or through the Breeze app, whether that be... Uh, dropping off a check here at the church office or mailing a check in, uh, know that that sacrifice means a lot. And through the monies that are raised, we continue to do the work that God would have us to do and share his love and the message of what Jesus did for us. And so shall we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've been thinking about and talking about the great sacrifice of Jesus. But now we too have an opportunity to give back. We've been blessed in so many ways. Uh, 
you have truly, truly been good to us. And so let us now give back a portion. Father, the monies that are collected, we know, will will go to spread your word, to further the work that we do here at Buckingham Road, to help those who are in need, Father, and there are just so many people that are in need at this time. And of course, Father, it also goes to support our missionaries who are in other places, but spreading the gospel message and extending your kingdom around the world. We've been blessed in so many ways, and we just thank you so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How he loves me, how I love him, he is risen, he is coming, Lord come quickly, hallelujah, what a friend he had in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear, what a friend of God, to carry everything to God in prayer. Good morning, church. We're really glad to have you this morning. And as uh, usual, we'd like to go ahead and try to reach out to all of you through uh, our elders' prayer time. Uh, one of the things that we want to keep on our, our minds and hearts in prayer is uh, Ross and their family. As you may have heard, that you know, Barbara had passed away last week. And so we want to continue to have Ross and their family in our prayers. Uh, also, Latanya. Trumbull, her mother, Glenna Cooper, has been having some issues with a tumor. Uh, she had asked for prayers for a simple solution for a cure. And we also want to rejoice in Latana's decision to be baptized this Sunday at 2.30 here at the building. So that's great news. Um, some other news, if you didn't know, Cameron is officially COVID-free, and we survived the quarantine as well. And so Regina and I are, are currently uh, out and about and are uh, allowed to be back in society, so that's good. I want to continue to be with, uh, say, prayers for all of those who are suffering from being infected, uh, such as Ben Drum and uh, others in our congregation, and just keep them in our prayers. Uh, we also want to continue to pray for our, our new brother, Donovan Paul, who was baptized last week. Um, he's been watching our online services and talking to Richard. And at 82 years old, he decided he wanted to give his life to Christ. So that's a fantastic, some fantastic news for Donovan. And we're excited for him. So let's go ahead and pray right now. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, beautiful um, congregation at uh, Buckingham Road. And we just thank you for the blessings that we have in our family here. Lord, we know that um, there are rough times, and we just pray you're... Uh, that you would be with those who are in need of your assistance, Lord. We especially pray for Ross uh, Hollingsworth and his loss of his lovely wife, Barbara. And we pray for their family and at this time during that, during that really tough time during that loss, Lord. We just thank you, God, for being with them. And we thank you for their family that have just been such a rock here at, at Buckingham Road. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we all, uh, we'll also pray for Glenna Cooper. Latana's mom, and just that uh, you would be able to find a cure for 
this tumor that has been bothering her. We just pray you be with her. And also we rejoice in Latana's decision to be baptized, God. We're just so thankful for her and her decision, as well as Donovan's decision to be baptized last week. Uh, just to know brothers and sisters in Christ that we can get to know and, and just to rejoice with them. We thank you, God, for Cameron and his recovery from COVID. And we pray you continue to be with those who are infected and those who are possibly have been exposed, Lord, that they may stay healthy. Um, and Lord, we just a special prayer that uh, you'd be with the search committee team and uh, uh, those who are also working uh, behind the scenes at Buckingham Road, Lord. We just thank you for their service and just continue to be with them and their families. We do love you, Lord. We thank you so much for uh, this church and for us to be able to work in in your area in Garland, and Richardson, and Dallas. Lord, we uh, ask that you'd bless us during this time of worship and continue to, continue to be with us faithfully as we uh, try and serve you in everything we do. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful Good morning. Uh, we are so thankful that you've tuned in with us to worship the Lord today. We hope you've been blessed by the songs that we praise God with and with the prayers and with the partaking of the Lord's Supper together. And, you know, we've had some great preaching the last three weeks. Uh, Tom Kimmy did so good three weeks ago. He's, he's a, not only a great youth minister, but he's a great preacher as well. And then Randy Daughtery gave us just what we needed as we continue to search for our next preacher. And uh, Randy was, was just wonderful. 
And then last week, I think everyone would agree that Brian Rendon just knocked it out of the park. We are so blessed to know this young man. We know God is going to do great things with him. And, you know, I realize I only have about five months left as your preacher. Uh, if you're like me, it's just amazing how fast this year is flying by. And one series I've wanted to preach for a long time is on the attributes of God. So I figure I better start it now. And maybe this is a good time to preach on the attributes of God because of with all that we've been through as a society, with all the problems, all the pain, the suffering we, we've gone through, people hopefully are looking for a relationship with God. Hopefully they're, they're wanting to know God better because uh, knowing God brings hope and brings peace and brings life. And really, knowing God should be the chief aim of our lives. Um, listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He said, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. So Jeremiah tells us, you know, it's, it's not in riches or wisdom or strength, but it's in knowing God. That's the most important thing in life. And the wisest man in the Old Testament, Solomon, backed that up in Proverbs 9 and verse 10. He said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's what we need, knowledge of the Holy One. And then Jesus, the wisest man who ever lived, came along and he said this the night before he died, John 17, he said, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus says, this is eternal life. Do you want eternal life? I know I do. Then Jesus says, you get to know the Father because that's where you find life. So the highest pursuit of life should be the knowledge of God. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be in this series uh, entitled Knowing God. And the first lesson I want us to talk about today is that God's ways are not our ways. And uh, if you know your Bible, you know that uh, title comes from a passage in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, where the Lord said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. Now, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I want to begin, uh, if you have your outline, I want to begin with, with this question. Why is there so much ignorance of God? Think about that for a moment. What would you say? Why, why is there so much ignorance of God? And I want to suggest three reasons. I know there are many. The first one may be because we know that God is too awesome uh, for any of us to understand or any of us to really grasp Him. So, you know, the attitude is for many, why even try? And, and that statement is somewhat true because we will never completely understand God. After all, He is God and we are not. That's a basic we need to get down right off the bat. He's infinite and we are finite. Listen to these scriptures, Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and His understanding no one can fathom. You know, we're, we're not able to grasp, we're not able to fathom God. And Paul backed that up in Romans 11.33. He said, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. To completely understand God, we would need to be God ourselves. So right off the bat, we've got to humble ourselves at the start of the study and admit that we are creatures and He's the Creator, that He's God, that we are not, and that we're never going to come close to grasping Him. But does that mean that we should just give up? That we should not even try to grow in our knowledge of Him? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. We must try. We must grow because we can understand so many things about God, at least to a degree, and knowing Him should be the chief aim of our life, uh, the most important thing. So we must try. Now, the second reason I want to talk about why there's so much ignorance of God is because Many are satisfied with a very superficial knowledge of God. So think about that. Are you, are you satisfied with a very superficial knowledge of God? I mean, you have a lot of relationships like that in life where you just barely know people and, and that's all you really want to know. Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's your kid's coach, and, and maybe you, you know their name and you have their phone number in case there's an emergency, but 
That's all you want. Uh, they're just an acquaintance, uh, and you're fine with that. A lot of people have that attitude towards God. They're satisfied, perfectly happy, barely knowing uh, the, anything about God. Uh, they come to church and maybe give him an hour a week, but, uh, but that's all. Uh, some might even be afraid if they really got to know God that they'd have to change their lives and they really don't want to do that. And so they willfully stay ignorant of him uh, and think that ignorance is bliss, which really it's not at all. Uh, we need to know God. Third reason, and maybe this is the major reason why so many are ignorant of God, is because our enemy spreads a lot of lies about God. Uh, this has been Satan's strategy, has been his goal uh, since the beginning of time, uh, to lie about and misrepresent God and, and draw people away from him. He started in the Garden of Eden. You remember everything was hunky-dory in the garden until you get to chapter 3 when Satan makes his appearance in the form of a serpent. And verse 1 of chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent lied. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, that was the way he attacked Adam and Eve, and, and he's still attacking us that way. His main goal is to slander and lie about God and impugn God and question God and spread false propaganda about God. And that's one major reason why there's so much ignorance of God in the world. You remember what Jesus said about Satan in, in John chapter 8. He said, you talking to the Pharisees, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, so often when people reject God, they're not rejecting the true God. They're rejecting a distorted caricature of God that Satan has sold them through his lies. And the reason Satan sticks with this strategy is that it works so well. It is so effective. In the first chapter uh, of Romans chapter 1, the last half of, of that chapter, Paul gives uh, the reason why the world is so sick with sin. And if you've read that chapter, verses 18 and following, he, he lists one sin after another uh, that, uh, that we suffer from in that passage. Idolatry, sexual immorality, homosexuality, murder, depravity, deceit, and on and on. And, and he tells us what the root cause of those sins is. He says in verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And in verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They gave up the true knowledge of God and accepted Satan's lies. They traded in the truth about God, and that's what led to all of the sickest sins in our society, the ignorance of God. That's the bad news. But, but there is good news, and the good news is that Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, he said to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth about God brings freedom, but the opposite is also true. If you don't know the truth about God, you will be in bondage. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. If you don't know the true God, the real God, then you're going to be a slave to a false God, and all of us worship something. All of us are slaves to something. You see, God knew exactly what Satan was up to by spreading his lies about him. And so what God did, he responded by sending a big dose of truth. And he sent it in a person. He sent it in his only son. Jesus came to this earth for one reason, to give us the truth about God. So, so note this secondly, that God came in the person of Jesus to present the truth about himself. The clearest revelation we'll ever have of who God is is when we look at Jesus of Nazareth. 
God wanted us to know him so badly that he took on our form. He wrapped himself in flesh in the person of his son so we could know him better. That's what John 1 and verse 18 says. It says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. That's one of the main reasons Jesus came was to make God known. <clears throat> I heard about a kindergarten teacher uh, in Bible class that uh, had a little time at the end of class, so she just let her kids draw whatever they wanted to draw, and, and she went by one student's desk and, asked, uh, desk and asked him what he was drawing, and he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she said, but nobody's ever seen God. Nobody knows what he looks like. And the kid confidently said, well, they'll know when I finish this picture. They'll know exactly what he looks like. You know, Jesus could really say the same thing. You'll know what God looks like, who he is, when I'm finished with this life I'm living down here on earth. So if you want to know God better, then look at Jesus. But you know, that's another reason why there's so much ignorance about the true God in this world. is because people aren't reading the book that tells about Jesus and that therefore tells about who God is. We've got to read the Bible if we want to know God and, and not just read it uh, like a book of facts and a book of history. We've got to read it for the purpose of getting to know God, of getting to know Jesus and being transformed into his image. I mean, you can know the Bible backwards and forwards, but if you miss Jesus, if you miss who God really is, you've missed the whole message. And that, that was the Pharisees' problem. They knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. But Jesus said to them in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and to have life. I mean, they knew the Old Testament so well, but somehow they missed who Jesus was, and therefore they missed who God was. What I want us to do in the second part of this lesson, I want us to look at three things that Jesus taught us about God. Now, he taught us a lot more than just three things, but I want us to concentrate on these today. And remember, we're talking about that our ways are not God's ways. And the first thing Jesus taught us that I want us to see is that God's not impressed by what most people think he's impressed by. Now, our way is most people, we think God is impressed by our great spirituality and our good deeds that we perform. So, you know, they think you've got to really do a lot of spiritual broad jumps and spiritual deep knee bends, and you better do them really well, and you better do an awful lot of them if you want to impress God. But Jesus says, no, that's not God's way. And he told us that through a story. You remember this story, this parable, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down, notice, looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now listen, for that audience, this was jaw-dropping, eyebrow-raising, <coughs> excuse me, teaching about God, because they thought the Pharisees were the most religious people in the world. But Jesus contradicted everything that they had been taught about God. <coughs> Our way... You know, most people think religion works like this. You work really, really hard at it. You build up your spiritual resume, and someday you'll stand before God, and, and you'll show Him that spiritual resume and all the good things you've done, all your good works, and you'll impress Him, and He'll let you into heaven. That's the way our way tends to work. It's kind of like, you know, how you get a bank loan. If you want to get a bank loan, you first got to prove to the to the bank that you really don't need it. That's the way it works. You show them all your assets. You show them all their, your resources. You show them all your collateral. You show them that you're going to be able to pay them back. And if it's enough, then they give you the loan. But you try walking into a bank where you have no assets, no resources, no collateral. There's no way you can pay them back and see, I mean, you really need some money and see if you get anything. Probably not. And a lot of people think that's how God works. On Judgment Day, you stand before him and you show him your spiritual assets and your spiritual resources and you show him all your good works. And then after you've proved 
You really don't need much grace. You really don't need much forgiveness. You really don't need much of the blood of Jesus, maybe just a few drops. You impress God, He will gladly let you into heaven. Now, that is dead wrong. That kind of thinking is way off base. What could we finite, sinful people possibly have to offer an infinite, holy, perfect God that would impress Him? And the answer is nothing. You know, Isaiah 64 and verse 6 plainly says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. We do not have any spiritual assets, any resources. We have no collateral to offer Him. That's not what God wants. What does God want? What is God's way? What will impress Him? What will impress Him is an attitude like this tax collector had. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God wants your humbled and your surrendered heart. That's what he wants. Micah 6 and verse 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's what God wants. Hosea 6 and verse 6, one version says, I don't want your sacrifices, God says. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. That's what God wants. That's what will impress him, that humble, repentant heart. Secondly, Jesus taught that God's love, or God doesn't love like most people think he loves. You know, our ways are not his ways. Our way, you know, is, is that God, uh, he loves that Pharisee that we just looked at in the temple uh, because he was such a good guy. And did you notice that Pharisee was praying? As he was praying, it said he looked down on everyone else, looked down on them, and especially he looked down on that tax collector. Let me ask you, who are you tempted to look down on? Who do you think you're better than? Now we know, maybe you're saying, man, I don't look down on anybody. We know we shouldn't do that. We know it's wrong. But it's really hard not to do that. So who are you tempted to look down on? Is it a murderer? Is it a child molester? Is it a prostitute? Um, who is it? Um, you know, since we often do it, we think that God must do it too. We think that God must really look down on rank sinners. And that's certainly what people in Jesus' day thought. Uh, that's why they were so critical of Jesus' choice of company that he kept. They constantly criticized him for socializing with the tax collectors and with known sinners. I mean... They said, if you're supposed to be a man of God, if you're, if you're holy, if you're a rabbi, why are you hanging out with this riffraff? And uh, that set the stage for one of Jesus' most startling teachings about who God is. And you know the story. It's found in Luke 15. Uh, it starts in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. Now we've heard this parable a million times and we know how it ends. But if, could, if you could imagine, if you were there that day and you heard this story for the first time and you're from that culture, how would you expect it to end? You probably expect it to end like this. The father saying, you're right, you're not worthy to be called my son, but because I'm a good man, I'll let you sleep out back in the bunkhouse with the field hands and I'll let you work with them, but you stay out of my sight because you've disgraced me as a father. That's what we'd expect. You know, I heard this week that the Buddhist religion has a story very similar to this, and the way it ends is with the father sentencing the son to shovel dung for 25 years. They thought that, you know, yeah, that's about right. That's what he deserved. That's how God would treat that sinner like that. But we know that's not how Jesus ended the story. We know how he ended the story. In verse 20, 
It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Jesus revealed a God that they did not know. He revealed a loving, compassionate, forgiving God. And I want to know, do you know this God? Do you know that you matter to God a whole lot more than you think you do? You know, we tend to think like this. I know God loves me, but He would love me a lot more if... And then you can fill in the blank. He would love me, he would love me a lot more if I read my Bible more. He, he'd love me a lot more if I prayed more. He'd love me a lot more if I would not lose my temper so much, if I would clean up my thought life, if I would clean up my actions, clean up my language, he'd love me more. He'd love me more if I would do more to serve, if I'd make more visits, if I'd take more meals, if, if I'd talk to people about Jesus more. And on and on we go. But I want to tell you, that's not true. Uh, listen, if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, listen to this. There is nothing you can do today that's going to make God love you any more than he does right now. And there is nothing you can do today that is going to make God decide to love you any less than He loves you right now. Because His love isn't based on your nature. His love isn't based on your performance. His love is based on His nature. Jesus was willing to die for you so you could know how much God loves you. And what more could He do than die for you? Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is truly unconditional. You know, even if you turn your back on God and you walk away from God and you live a reprobate life and you die lost and you go to hell, God is still going to love you just as much right up to the point of your death and hope that you will repent. That's our God. We don't deserve that kind of love. But He loves us like that Anyway, God doesn't love like most people think He loves. And then the last thing is God doesn't save how most people think He saves. Remember, our ways are not God's ways, and most people think the way to be saved is to be good enough to be saved. I mean, if you ask uh, the, uh, most people on the street, will you go to heaven? They'll say, well, I sure hope so. I mean, I've lived a pretty good life, better than most. And what? Most people picture of judgment is a big scale on judgment day with all their good stuff piled on one side and all their bad stuff piled on the other side. And, and, uh, and you know, you have the idea that your good stuff is going to outweigh your bad stuff. And if it does, you get to go to heaven. Now, the problem with that is that most people overestimate their goodness and underestimate their sin. Plus, the Bible teaches, you know, just one unforgiven sin will outweigh everything else keep you out of heaven anyway. You know, when we stand before the absolute blinding holiness of God, we're going to understand how far we've fallen short of His glory and that none of us can ever be good enough to do anything about saving ourselves. You know, Romans 3.10 says there's no one righteous. No, not one. But that doesn't mean there's no way to be saved. God's way is not our way. Uh, and maybe we get a picture of it best in, in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. At the cross, it says one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And you know, a lot of us have a real problem with that story. I mean, you just wait just a minute. That's not fair. You mean a condemned thief can still be saved? Yeah. You mean he can be saved right at the last minute? Yeah. Does he? Did he have time to do anything good? No. He never got off that cross. Did he have an impressive spiritual resume? Certainly not that we know of. He was a criminal being crucified. Did he purchase or bargain or perform somehow his way into heaven? No. 
Neither can we. You know, we can only do what he did. And that is admit that we're sinners and throw ourselves on the mercy of God and do what he says. Look at the man on the cross and ask him to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. See, we've got to know God and we've got to obey the gospel if we want to be saved. What is the gospel? You know, the gospel is that we've all sinned and we've all fallen hopelessly short of the glory of God and that we can't do anything to save ourselves. And, and so God loved us so much, he sent Jesus who came down from heaven and became one of us and lived a sinless, perfect life and became our substitute on the cross. In his death, he took our penalty. He paid our debt that we couldn't pay. He took our sin on himself and he offers us his righteousness by his grace, by his gift. And then they took him down from the cross and they buried him in a tomb, but the grave couldn't hold him. And on the third day, he rose Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He uh, stayed around for 40 days, showing himself to many of the believers. And then he ascended to heaven and he sits at God's right hand where he intercedes for us right now until he returns someday to take us home. That is the gospel that saves us. But we must accept it by faith. We must trust him alone to save us. Uh, we must throw ourselves on his mercy, repent of our sins, obey him, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection so that his blood will cleanse us and purify us. And someone might say, wait a minute, that thief, he didn't get baptized. Well, he lived while Jesus was still alive and in his ministry. Jesus could save anybody he wanted to. Not only that, the day of Pentecost hadn't occurred yet. And on that day, the gospel was preached for the first time and we were told what we must do to be saved to accept this gift of grace and that is to have faith in Jesus and repent of our sins and to be baptized. And the question is, do you believe that? Listen, Satan will do all he can to keep you from hearing and keep you from believing that. But if you believe it, then obey it. You know, Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus after he had prayed and, and fasted for three days and repented and believed in God, had seen Jesus, he said to him, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Call on his name for mercy. And the way you do that is by being baptized. So if we can help you, obey the gospel. If we can help baptize you, we would love to be able to do this. Let us know how we can help you. Let us know how we can talk to you about that. Or, or if we can pray with you about anything, please contact us. Let us know how we can help. God loves you. Let me encourage you to get to know him better. And I want to thank you for tuning in. This, and we pray that you will have a great week. Thank you so much. God bless you. There was one who was willing to die in mercy that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sin with him there. He is tender and loving and patient with me while he cleanses my heart of its dross. But there's no condemnation I know I am free, for my sins are on nail to the cross. They are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear with what Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sin with him there. I would cling to my Savior and
services. We're so blessed that we can bring this to you each week. We thank you guys for being there and, and worshiping with us this morning. And just remember that those of us that are that are coming each week to the building, we'll be there, you know, Sunday morning to worship and praise with you guys. And uh, just hope that you guys enjoyed this service. Let us close with a prayer. Oh, Heavenly, Mike, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Father, so much for bringing this uh, service to us again. Father, thank you for the means that we have to be able to do this. Lord, we just pray that as we continue to go about this day and this life, Father, we continue to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you do. We thank you, Father, so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Father. And most important, Father, we thank you for your Son and his sacrifice for us on the cross. And it's his great and precious holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen.